Hmm. It does solve the mind body. Oh, hello there. <laughs> We're back with another reaction today. I'm really excited to get to the discussion part of this uh, video that I found with the um, presentations by Firebond and uh, Firebend, is that how you say it? I don't know, and Herbert Feigl, which I've just been really floored with by how it mirrors contemporary discussions between, you know, for exa example, illusionists and panpsychists, panpsychists, uh, illusionists and panpsychists. This discussion so far, each of them have presented their side, I found very reminiscent of the current debate. So that's interesting. And I want to hear what they say to each other, which is the part that I'm at now. So here we are, and we're just going to hop right into it. So let's do it. Pick up one of the other issues first, or shall we have the audience immediately? What is your wish? The, the, Your pleasure, Dr. There, there are so many facets to this uh, problem, this whole cluster of problems, that uh, <coughs> we should perhaps uh, pay attention to the... I just noticed they have the picture of the guy speaking up every time they speak. That's really nice. So I just switched over back to Feigl because uh, that's him speaking right there, right? So, okay. So he says, uh, who wants to start? Uh, I'm going to go. <laughs> Typical philosopher. <laughs> the rest of the, of the audience. Perhaps I could trigger off something by uh, asking you, Dr. Fayam, about uh, the practical significance that you just mentioned, uh, which according to your view depends on the acceptance of, of one or the other kind of theory concerning the mental and the physical. Now, I think quite aside from... Oh, I turned up the volume. Hopefully it's better this time. I don't know. This is a poor audio recording, but so if you can't hear what he's saying very well, he's saying he's going to ask something practical. Um, something about the practical uh, implications of the theory of consciousness one holds, which Feyerbahn was talking about. Traditional theological or religious ideologies, and I think that even quite uh, sober-minded and irreligious, uh, non-metaphysical psychiatrists nowadays would still make a distinction between, uh, let's say, psychoneuroses and physical diseases. Uh, this psychiatrist may... Oh yeah, so by the way, it's hot. I had the AC on. Probably this mic is picking it up, so sorry if you can hear that noise, but uh, yeah. So what's he saying? He's saying sober-minded professionals in psychiatry are going to make a distinction between the mental and the physical. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. Also, where's he going with this? I do not deny that the psychoneurosis has also a physical basis in the sense that if we knew much more about the brain and what kind of pathways are blocked or, or what have you, we would be able to explain such things. You know, as repression and the symptom formation and psychoneurosis and so on. Nevertheless, for the practical... It's so hard for me to listen to it at this speed, so normally I would put this on <laughs> at least 1.75 um, to save some time. Instead, I'm going through it slowly and also stopping at five seconds to pontificate. So this is taking me a lot longer. <laughs> Let's speed it up a little bit, guys. ...of present-day medicine. Of okay, so... Have you? We would be able to explain such phenomena as repression and the symptom formation and psychoneurosis and so on. Nevertheless, for the practical purposes of present day medicine, of uh, psychiatry and clinical psychology, the distinction between, let us say, the physical uh, condition that arises when a brain tumor causes various symptoms and when there is a purely psychoneurotic condition involved, this is a tremendous difference. Of course, a behaviorist, I don't think you're a behaviorist, all right? <laughs> uh, the will say so he says he's not a behaviorist. Yeah, he's a, a limitivist, but uh, limitivists are not behaviorists because they posit internal processes to explain behavior. Um, and he's also not a behaviorist in that other sense of the term that doesn't posit definitional relationships between mental terms and behavior. But what's he saying here? So I th he's saying, like, these guys are going to pot because. They're going to say, call some things mental, but not because they think they're not physical. I, I think that's what he's saying, but because they just don't know the physical basis right now. 
So we still may keep these terms around. Is this a point against the limitivism? Even if the mind is not a non-physical thing, we shouldn't eliminate it because we may use the term mental for practical reasons to pick out things that we know are ultimately physical, but yet don't understand the physical basis of it. That's the point. What kind of treatment do we have for psychoneurosis? Is the talking cure that Freud uh, initiated, or that uh, having this even before Freud among, among friends? Uh, uh, the talking cure. Um, wait, so what is he saying here? Hold on. First, I don't think you are a behaviorist, or I'm <laughs> agreeing on that one. Uh, the behaviorist would say, well, what kind of treatment do we have for psychoneurosis? Is the talking cure that Freud uh, initiated, or that uh, having this even before Freud among, among friends, and talk things out. But that's physical, after all. The patient. Wait, so the behaviorist is going to say, what's the cure for the mental? thing that we call it we're calling mental here well if their behaviorist is the talking cure <laughs> that's a way of making fun of freud psychoanalysis but he said it happens with freud but also amongst friends <laughs> what a smart ass okay um yeah right okay freud among, among friends and talk things out but that's physical after all the patient utters words the doctor hears them, the, the doctor hears other words, the patient hears them. Uh, this is physical interchange, but it is physical interchange of a kind where the kind of effect that takes place may be noticeable later in the behavior, but where the micro mechanism so far is completely obscure. I mean, what kind of pathways are opened up by psychotherapy, we do not know or can only vaguely guess as far as I can see. So the issue is a little more subtle. I don't think that these people hold a spiritualistic view of the human soul, they really make a practical, a practically important distinction between mental diseases and physical diseases. And they might uh, leave completely open the question, or might, might even hold the belief that later on, if we go into the subtleties of the brain processes, we will find out what the psychoneuroses are due to. Well, this is one point that I think might invite discussion by the audience. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think this is a point you can make in response to people who say that humans are naturalistically, natural dualists, uh, because people do, this, you know, distinguish between the mental and the physical. <clears throat> Naively and commonsensically, we say, you know, the mental and the physical. But it may just be that there's just kind of, uh, we think of the, the mental as a special case of the physical or something. Um, Maybe the special case is that we don't know the cause of it or how it's rooted or something like that. So that with this this idea that people distinguish commonsensically between the mind and the mental and the physical doesn't mean that they think of the mental as non-physical. That and that's something I think is interesting and important if you're thinking about like uh, you know the hard problem of consciousness and is it widespread and do a lot of people do naive people before they study I shouldn't say naive common sense uh, ordinary folks. <laughs> Do they, before they study the mind, have these views about the hard problem, explanatory gaps, etc.? Um, or are they, and, and people say, well, yeah, look, people naively distinguished, uh, commonsensically distinguished between um, the mental and the physical. Uh, but Feigl's point here is, yeah, but they may be for practical things. Um, and, you know, I think we do this in other places, too, like with human and animal. People say, humans aren't animals. My son said this to me the other day. Like, what do you think we are, minerals or rocks? Like, of course we're animals. What they mean is that we're unique or special kind of animals. We're not an animal just like other animals. There's some things about us that are unique. So, okay, so they, they, they're not going to, so maybe, so I'm interpreting this the way I like it, but I think the point he's making here is that we may not want to, that the limitivism issue is more subtle. And I now realized last time at the end of the video, because I was editing it, uh, when I was talking, uh, listening to Firebrand, I was saying, is he in Limitivist? Yeah, he had that comment earlier in the video about if you're a good materialist, you deny the existence of pains. So he clearly is in the Limitivist. And then I went and looked up and read the Sanford Encyclopedia Philosophy article on him, and obviously he's a Limitivist. <laughs> in fact, Rorty's Limitivism, which, with which I'm familiar, seems to have come from some work of Firebrand's uh, from what I read. Okay, so this, I think, is a point against his Limitivism. 
Let's see where they take it. Well, if we go into the subtlety of the brain processes, we will find out what the cycle neurons are due. Well, this is one point that I think might invite discussion by the audience. Uh, there are other philosophical points that excite me much more. I don't know whether we should take the time to go into them. I quite <laughs> Wait, what? Did he just? Did he just literally say this point might bring up discussion from the audience? But there's other things that I'm <laughs> I'm more interested in. I'm going to skip that. <laughs> Philosophers, or is he going to stop and let the audience mm -hmm. talk? Hold on. Is that my headphones? Is the audio messed up right there? What you said about the impoverishment of our knowledge when we come. What you seem to say is that knowledge by acquaintance, the knowledge that, for instance, I am musical, so I can describe the musical experiences I have, uh, how poor my words may, may uh, describe them. Still, I know what I'm talking about when I talk about the tune or a harmony or a chord. Uh, uh, or a certain flow of, of melodies, simultaneous melodies, as you have in uh, a piece of chamber music or the symphony. So, I don't have to refer to the physical stimuli, I can describe the phenomena. So the knowledge is not, the knowledge by is not reduced to zero, there is, in my opinion, this double access. Of course, I, I like a monistic theory and I favor your physicalistic tendencies because I do think, I agree here completely with you, good scientific explanations will in all likelihood come from physical theories rather than from spiritualistic or mentalistic theories. We haven't got any mentalistic theories. Present day psychology is not in any way a unified theory. It's a set of theorets, of little theories. Uh, <laughs> problem, perception, memory, volition, desire. Uh, you say we don't have a theory of psychology? What do you say, theorets? And <laughs> little theories? theories? We haven't got any mentalistic theories. Present day psychology is not in any way a unified theory. It's a set of theorets, of little theories. <laughs> theorets, or little theories. <laughs> What is his point about acquaintance, though? I mean, he's going on here for quite a bit, but uh, what is his uh, point about acquaintance? That's not reduced to zero because it's not just mere acquaintance and there, it's not like a, 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 a blind. There is a something there, that, but I, I'm acquainted with the character of it. Is that the point that he's making? But, yeah. Uh, my problem, perception, memory, volition, desire, uh, learning, and the motivation, and so on. We haven't got what? Learning, desire, motivation? Wait, hold on, let me go back there. Good scientific explanation will in all likelihood come from physical right. theories rather than from spiritualistic or mentalistic theories. We haven't got any mentalistic theories. Present day psychology is not in any way a unified theory, it's a set of theorets, of little theories. Uh, my problem, perception, memory, volition, desire, uh, learning, and motivation, and so on. We haven't got any unifying theory. In ah, the I see. Okay, so he's saying progress is going to come from the physical sciences because we don't have a mentalistic theory. I mean, maybe some progress on that has been made with idealism and, and panpsychism lately. You could debate that, actually, but maybe. Um, maybe. But uh, so the theorets point we have theories of learning theories of volition theories of motor movement planning etc but no overarching unifying theory of the mind i think that's right by the way let's see where they're going with this if we ever get one we will probably get it via neurophysiology but that is music of the future at the present this is utopia at the moment so it becomes a theory of <laughs> wait what did he say so this is utopian at the moment so i'd still I'm not sure what they mean by utopia. What I think they mean is like a completed or solved science that solves everything, like a grand unified theory of everything, physically. Okay, but what, what just happened? In psychology, if we ever get one, we will probably get it via neurophysiology, but that is music of the future at the present. This is utopia at the moment. So it becomes a theory of stories. Okay. <laughs> so, well, may, I, may I say something to the, to the first remark? What did he say? Uh, neurophysiology, but that is music of the future at the present. This is utopia at the moment. So is the constancy of stories. Okay. <laughs> so, well. so is the constancy of theories? 
Is that what he's saying? So is the constancy of theories. What is he? Is he making a joke about like Kuhn? 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 How do you say it? K H U N E Kuhn? Kuhn? Thomas Kuhn? Kuhn? <laughs> How do you say it? I don't know. I've never said it out loud. Uh, anyway, um, is he making a point about like from Newton to Einstein, there's no continuity of one single theory about physical reality, but there's um, so, so the, there's, a, there's a question of philosophy of science like, did Newton? And um, Einstein agree on what mass was, for example, because in, in relativity physics, mass has, you know, it's rel relative to the frame of reference. There's resting mass, inertial mass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a question about whether, uh, or to take another example, take the, the idea of the limit from calculus. Did, they, did Newton have the same idea of the limit as modern mathematicians? Well, it's changed a lot since then. Um, so was that a joke about that? Or am I getting too just hung up on... <laughs> a parenthetical side for Mark White. Brother, this is utopia, but come on. So it's the constancy of stories. Okay. <laughs> so, well, may, may I say something to the, to the first remark about the distinction, the working distinction, which... Uh, uh, which Let me say something about the first remark about the working... That is quite right. There's a nice example. At the time of Newton, the atomic theory was adopted by Newton and by many people. And uh, when heat was discussed, it was discussed in terms of very, very small particles. But these particles could not be identified, and so for people, they introduced the heat substance. A heat is a specific substance which was the caloric, as it was called, which was out of the Okay, heat. so he's talking about an old theory about heat. And so what he said was they're, they're trying to figure out what heat was, so the atomic theory was around. So they thought heat would be some kind of particle, like an atom, some, some, something particle like. They couldn't find it, so they invented this stuff called caloric. And I know about caloric. It's like phlogiston. Phlogiston is like something that explains combustion or fire, whereas caloric, I think, is like, it's, yeah, something that explains warmth or heat. Um, okay. So we know what happens. There is no such thing. We know what the point Simply, on. with the amount of caloric, always thinking that some future time, perhaps, I mean, in a, in a count could be given in terms of four atoms. But this hope that some future time the account could be given in terms of atoms in the history, sometimes suddenly slowly disappeared. And it might new theory came up. And the theory of heat which had nothing to do with atoms at all, and which uh, the phenological thermodynamics, oh. phenological thermodynamics, which uh, talked about continuous stuff which was a completely alternative theory, and was even developed in such a fashion that it contradicted the assumption that an atomic account could be given of everything. Now what I would say, I'm all for the, for, for the first stage. Wait, hold on, what? So... There's the caloric fluid. They thought they would explain it in terms of atoms, but then they gave an explanation not in terms of atoms. I mean, heat is mean molecular motion, kinetic motion of molecules or atoms or something, right? So what is he saying here? Let me hear this again. What? Let me hear this again. And which uh, the phenological thermodynamics, oh. phenological thermodynamics, which uh, talked about, talked about thermodynamics. slowly disappeared. And it might new theory came up. I mean, the theory of heat, which had nothing to do with atoms at all, and which uh, the phenological thermodynamics, oh. phenological. What's he saying right there? <laughs> it's frustrated. Um, a theory in which heat had nothing to do with atoms at all, something, something thermodynamics. What is he saying? In the history, sometimes suddenly slowly disappeared. And it might new theory came up. I mean, the theory of heat, which had nothing to do with atoms at all, and which uh, the phenological thermodynamics, oh. phenological thermodynamics, which uh, talked about continuous stuff, which was a completely alternative theory, and was even developed in such a fashion that it contradicted the assumption that an atomic account could be given of everything. Now, what I would say, I'm all for the, for, for the first step, uh, which corresponds to the case you have pointed out in the case uh, of, of neurophysiology, where there's different kinds of, of causes, I mean, more obvious ones and less obvious ones. Or okay, so I... I s I mean, I think I see the analogy he's trying to draw here because when Feigl was setting up the question, he was like, okay, so they may draw this distinction between mental and physical simply because there are some diseases they don't know the physical causes of. So they use the term mental to pick those out, but they don't mean non-physical by it. They mean things that we don't understand the physical causes of. Okay. So he responds, Firebrand responds, um... Well, in history, there's been cases like this where we didn't know the underlying mechanisms, and heat is one of those, and we had differing ideas about how it would get, 
how it would ultimately turn out. And then instead of going, aha, let's keep this term around, we said, no caloric, get rid of it. Is that the point that he's making here? I think, I th I think I'm getting it. It's hard to, with the audio and <laughs> my innate disposition to be dense. <laughs> it's hard to... Uh... From your physiology, there are these different kinds of, of causes. I mean, more obvious ones and less obvious ones. All is to be material, but I'm against the second state, where the second kind of cause, which one can't see so clearly, is not regarded as a material cause, not clearly seen, but it is not material cause clearly seen. And uh, this, I think, uh, happens very frequently nowadays, as examples do, is only against the second thing, against the first thing, that's the working distinction, and I think this first working distinction is also supposed to be, in any case, from the point of view of life. Now, next thing, to the immediate family. Wait, hold on, what was that? Let me, I'm going back. Yeah, it's hard to understand this shit, dude. Which we have talked about continuous stuff, which was a completely alternative theory, and was even developed in such a fashion that it contradicted the assumption that atomic account could be given a value. Now, I thought it said it contradicted the assumption that an atomic account was even available. What is this other theory that he's talking about with its heat? Is it just the caloric fluid that he's... Is that the idea? I wish I had clearer understanding of what the analogy here was. I'm all for the, for, for the first thing, uh, which corresponds to the case you have pointed out in the case uh, of, of neurophysiology, where there are different kinds of, of causes. I mean, more obvious ones and less obvious ones. All is to be material, but I'm against the second state, where the second kind of cause, which one can't see so clearly, is not regarded as a material cause, not clearly seen, but is a not material cause clearly seen. And uh, this, I think, uh, happens very frequently nowadays, as examples, which is only against the second thing, I guess the first thing, that's the working distinction, and I think this first working distinction is also supposed to be, in any case, from the point of view of life. Now, next thing, to the immediate... So he's talking about stages here. What are these stages? So the first stage... We don't know what the causes are or what the mechanisms are. And then the second stage, we, f we have some idea about what they are. Is that the idea? And then that's when the elimination, but it, he says a bunch of stuff really fast. <laughs> I cannot figure it out. One, one more try and then we're going to have to move on. Or is you to be material, but I'm against the second stage, where the second kind of cause which one can't see so clearly is not regarded as a material cause, not clearly seen, but is a not material cause clearly seen. And uh, this, I think... Wait, so there's the first stage where you just have this practical distinction, and then he's saying the second stage is where you don't regard it as a physical cause not clearly seen, but as a non-physical cause clearly seen. That's what he just said right there. So he's saying, I think, that this, this practical distinction slippery slopes you into a... Uh oh, I'm thinking now in terms of this mysterious non-physical thing. Is that what he's saying here? Of course, not clearly seen, but is it not material cause clearly seen? And uh, this, I think, uh, happens very frequently nowadays. For example, which is only against the second thing. I guess the first thing that's the working distinction, and I think this first working distinction is also supposed to be, in any case, the point of view of life. Now. Okay, so you start with the first working distinction. I think what he was saying right there is that was the point of view of Freud. That Freud, when he said these things were psychological, what he meant was, yeah, probably there's a physical cause, but we just don't know about it yet. So I think he's agreeing. But, that, that, but the transition from the stage one, where you see it as a, a physical cause not clearly seen, to a non-physical cause clearly seen, that transition, uh, this mental thing, well, by mental we mean physical thing we don't understand, but then suddenly you morph into, oh, by mental, I mean non-physical thing I do understand. Um, that happens very fast, right? That's what he's saying right here. I think this first working distinction was also supposed to be, in any case, from the point of view of life. Now, next thing, to the immediate thing, we need immediately perceive. There are so many things to be said about it. This is, this is can't really be cute. This is uh, the, the, the following. Um, first of all, Usually, we, we could make a utopia of how we start to know the world. Let's assume we start with a utopic account. First, we have things we immediately perceive. They're really into utopias. <laughs> what do they keep saying? A utopian account of how we perceive the world. So I think a problem free. I'm just going to go with utopia means problem free. <laughs> Not Eden or paradise. Perfect city or something. Um, 
so we start with uh, so how do we perceive the world in the good case right i know the world assume we start with a topic in terms first we have things we immediately perceive reds fading into greens the red things with something in between something gray something dark gray i mean two black circles red and so on this is such a pattern so we start out <clears throat> all right so we start off with basic color experiences shapes red patterns okay right okay Hard gray, I mean two black circles, red, and so on. This is such a pattern, so we start out. Then <coughs> make a little theorizing and introduce the objective out of earth. And we say, we talk now not anymore about the reds and the greens, but about tables, chairs, which have the color red and black, and so on. Uh, wow, really? So he's saying we start with the colors, the shapes, colors, etc. Then we do some theorizing, and then we say there's, there are things out there objects suddenly now having colors shapes that doesn't seem right to me <laughs> that doesn't seem right to me is that right no we start off thinking it's not a theory that there's objects out there it's a theory that there's experiences in the way he's yeah okay interesting okay more about the reds and the greens, but about tables, chairs, which have the color red and black and so on. This means the objective part. And this means into the original conception, this pure conception of red and green, which we're almost close to glance about this next, uh, uh, we, we add our, all our knowledge about what other relations they obtain in the outer world. Now, I don't see any reason why this should be forced to be done with the inner world. Because just He's saying we objectify our experiences into the existence of an outer world. I mean, that's just way too sense data theorists. Is that just because they're stuck in the sense data era right here? Um, but then he just went on to say, I don't see why that why we wouldn't also do that to the inner world. So now we're going to start objectifying our experiences. In the outer world. Now, I don't see any reason why this should be forced to be done with the inner world. Because just as the production of red depends, or of green, depends on many causes in the outer world, it also depends on many concomitants in the inner world. So it is regarded as legitimate, as it is by you, I think, to objectify the outer world by making this difference. And when we talk about the reds of the inner world, make a concept in terms of which we describe it so very poor. So, uh, so he said, if according to you, it's okay to do this to the outer world, there are objects out there, blah, blah, blah. Why can't we do this to the inner world? Ah, there's like the experience of red now suddenly a non-physical thing that has a... So why, why can't we do the same thing? That's the question back? I hope you don't. I agree with you on this. Uh, Wait, hold on. And Feigl just said he agrees with him on this. Objectifying the outer world by making this difference. And when we talk about the rates of the inner world, make a concept in terms of which we describe it so very poor. So... Uh, You're running an open door. I agree with you on this. I agree with enriching the nomological network, the network yeah. of, of causal relations, yeah. of lawful relationships. But then well, that is fine. But then I, I really say that uh, in a purely phenomenological account of my experience, I don't have this. But the pure phenomenological account is just a pure account uh, which should be filled out. I mean, we already well, know too for much. For the sake of science, certainly. We already know. I mean, no such thing. We already know too much about what goes inside to go on living with these pure terms, with these pure qualitative terms. So when they are still there, they are something for the dinosaurians, but not for our present state of knowledge. Our present state of knowledge. Did he say dinosaurians? That's part. Of, so these terms are there, but only if it's part of history. Is that that's what he's saying? Wait, what are they? Hold on. Let's go back because I'm. You describe it so very poor. So. Uh, Hold on. Reds fading into greens, the red things with something in between, something gray, something dark gray, I mean two black circles, red, and so on. This is such a pattern, so we start out. Then we make a little theorizing and introduce the objective out of earth. And we say, we talk now not anymore about the reds and the greens, but about tables, chairs, which have the color red and black, and so on. This means the objective part. And this means into the original conception, this pure, pure conception of red and green, which we're almost close to glance about this next, uh, uh, we, we add our, all our knowledge about what other relations they obtain in the outer world. Now, I don't see any reason why this should be forced to be done with the inner world. Because just as the production of red depends, or of green, depends on many causes in the outer world, it also depends on many concomitants in the inner world. So it is regarded as legitimate, as it is by you, I think, to objectify the outer world by making this difference. And when we talk about the rates of the inner world, make a concept in terms of which we describe it so very poor. So, uh, you're running an open door, so I agree with you on this. 
Yeah. He agrees because the thing, the conscious thing, is a brain state. Is that basically the idea that Feigl's gonna? What? 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 I agree with enriching the homological metaphor. Wait, what did he say? I agree with everything. Concepts in terms of which you describe it, so very poor. So, uh, you're running an open doors. I agree with you. Uh, I agree with enriching the homological metaphor yeah. of, of causal relations, yeah. of lawful relationships. But then well, that is fine. But then I can say that uh, in a purely phenomenological account of my experience, I don't have this but it's network of law. So what is he saying? I agree with these lawful relationships amongst the physical objects, but I don't have that amongst my experiences. Is that what he's saying? I can say that uh, in a purely phenomenological account of my experience, I don't have this. But it's I think what he just said is, in a purely phenomenological account of my experience, I don't have those. Is that like a space of reasons versus space of causes type of point right there <clears throat> that he's saying? So, so Fireband's, Fireband uh, seems to have this view where we start with experiences and we objectify them into the uh, outer world. Seems wrong to me, but whatever. So why can't we get these inner things Feigl says, and we can, but out there there's these law-like con relations, connections, which science studies, but strictly phenomenologically, I don't have those. Or is this an uh, anomalous monism point that he's making? I wonder, yeah, let me, okay, let's, let's continue. But then I can say that uh, in a purely phenomenological account of my experience, I don't have this. But if you can account, this trust a pure account, uh, which would be filled up? I mean, we, we, Wait, hold on, are you mistrust well, That is fine. But then I can say that uh, in a purely phenomenological account of my experience, I don't have this. But if you can a local account, this trust a pure account, uh, which would be filled up. I mean, we already well, know too much. For the sake of science, sir. We already know. I mean, no such thing. We already know too much about what goes inside to go on living with these pure terms, with these pure qualitative terms. So he said, we already know too much about what goes on to go on with these pure qualitative terms. Something we talked about last time in the last videos. I don't. I think the pure phenomenal concepts versus the other. So if you just have a, if you admit there's a plurality of concepts, the ways that we think about the uh, our experience, I think that would solve this problem. Or maybe he thinks there, you don't have the, the pure kind, because everyone's going to be theory laden in this way or something like that. But uh, yeah. Well, you know too much about what goes inside to go on living with these pure terms, with these pure qualitative terms. So when they are still there, they are something for the dinosaurians, but not for our present <laughs> Yeah, he did say something for the dinosaurians. <laughs> so here are these qualitative terms. We know too much about that, about what goes on. So there's no place for them in the world. There's no place for them in the mind. I think that's what he's saying. So we got to get rid of them. <laughs> no, I, I have the strike of argument. No doubt he will refute it. Psychophysiology is an empirical science. Wait, what did he say? I have oh, Wait, hold on. So he said, I have an argument to refute you? <laughs> no, I, I have the striking argument. No doubt he will refute it. Psychophysiology is an empirical science. Psychophysiology, as it began last century, let's say, in a responsible fashion, tried to correlate uh, mental events or mental types of events with uh, neurophysiological ones in the nervous system, particularly. All right, so psychophysiology tries to correlate mental events with physical events. Now we call it cognitive neuroscience, but we're still trying to do the same thing, right? Okay. This is nothing that one could reason out in an a priori armchair fashion. This is an experimental science. You have to find out what are the correlations between uh, the elements on one side and on the other. Yeah, experimental science, you got to find correlations between one side and the other. Okay. So, uh, this presupposes that we can recognize a feeling of pain or a smell of violence when we have it. We must have knowledge by acquaintance, in this sense, in order to even get started in psychophysiology. Because if you don't do that, then you have psychophysics of a behavioristic sort. Or psychophysics. I mean, I, I, I see what he's doing here, but I, I think we would just make this distinction currently a slightly different way. So he's saying you can't even do science without some notion of acquaintance because you have to ask the person, did you see it? Did you smell it? But 
acquaintance here has a, has a connotation in the modern times that it may not have had back then. But uh, what we would say is like access. You need some kind of access to the state in order to report it and say, ah, blah, 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 I'm, I'm seeing it or smelling it. Um, now, is that kind of access acquaintance? Is it something cognitive? That's what the, a lot of the current debate in the sciences has been about um, and, and uh, in related areas. Acquaintance is still around. People still talk about it. But I think access, I think nowadays we could say acquaintance is one kind of access, access to the, the conscious experience itself. But I see what he's saying, right? It's the same idea. If you just take acquaintance out and put access in there, you get the point. Because if you don't do that, then you have psychophysics of a behavioristic sort, or psychophysiology of a behavioristic sort, which just will not do. Uh, by the way, maybe I should advertise uh, Professor Skinner's lecture, which I think will be in this, in this hall uh, next, uh, this week, Thursday evening. Skinner, I think, is... A plug for Skinner. <laughs> Yeah, so there's got to be some kind of access to the mind, unless you're a behaviorist. Or I guess you could be like Dennett, right? Dennett doesn't really have access in this sense, but it's something like a global workspace theory. And that's in other view areas viewed as a kind of access theory of consciousness. Um, so, so even on Dennett's view, I think, you know, fame in the brain or whatever counts as a kind of access. But there are ways of reading this, his view where you don't have access, actually. You just have someone ask you a question and then one of these states gets selected and just gets... And that's the, you know, what did he call the Pandora model? Just all these random states. Anyway, I, I don't want to... This isn't about that. Let's get back to this discussion. Most consistent and most brilliant behaviors that America has produced. I profoundly disagree with him, but I must hand it to him that... Uh, and we've argued when he was professor here for many, many years. But uh, he, he will give a very suggestive and persuasive formulation of his behavioristic viewpoint. Don't miss the lecture. This, this is really something very brilliant. Uh, perhaps we'll have a discussion and then you'll hear why we disagree with him. He'll be on the same side, I think. This, this is a kind of reductionist philosophy, but it, it, he's, worked, he's changed it considerably. Well, to come back to our point, psychophysiology is an so Skinner, he's saying he disagrees with them, but it respects them. Okay. Unless you make it into a correlation of peripheral behavior to central processes, then of course it's a purely physical science. But if you first relate introspectively accessible qualities and experiences to the corresponding neurophysiological events, little of that behavior no matter how little of that sort of knowledge we have so far, this is still an empirical science. After all, Aristotle uh, still considered the brain nearly as a sort of cooling organ, like the radiator and the car, you know, cooling organ for the blood. He thought, uh, with all the poets, that our feelings and emotions are in our heart or chest and so on. One cannot understand that. But Poor Aristotle, he gets hated on a lot. Yeah, he did think that, but what would you think if you didn't know anything <laughs> and just looked at the brain? So he didn't think the brain was involved in thinking, is what he's saying. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so I, I like what he's saying here. As we know from watching these previous videos, I'm on Feigl's side here, Faith, um, for, for, for sure on his side. Uh, he's saying, look, you know, the subject has a kind of access, acquaintance to their own mental qualities, these own experiences. You ask them, this, did they say it? They say yes. Then you look for the correlates. You find the brain state, uh, which correlates with that. Um, and so that you're doing the science of consciousness basically in 1962. Fantastic. I still consider the brain nearly as a sort of cooling organ, like the radiator and the car, you know, cooling organ for the blood. He thought, uh, with all the poets, that our feelings and emotions are in our heart or chest and so on. One cannot understand that. But uh, of course, uh, psychophysiology has told us otherwise. People who have amputated legs or arms uh, still. Oh, I see what the point he's making there. He's saying, you know, Aristotle thought I was the heart. But oh, empirically, we discovered the brain is what's important, not, um, and the same is going to be true about, you know, is there, the pain is in your leg or something, if amputations, I see where he's going with that. So th these are things that uh, we empirically discover. Uh, fingers or toes, and that indicates that uh, those sensations are central rather than uh, peripheral. So the effects of psychophysiology have to be found out by experience. I maintain against you that. Uh, such a science would be impossible if we did not have at least this poor knowledge, which I just sketched, on the mental side. Only that would 
Ja, ja nou, dat wordt niet gestart. Ja, ik denk dat ik het niet de kinderen die samen met die oude met die juiste lichten in die video. En daar kan we samen voor. En wat de eerste impressie is van de individuele business, is simpelweg een goede impressie. En ook. Yes. Nou, we gaan op de theory of sound. En de theory of sound is dat de notice calls by the grid to the air. Hold on, hold on, I can. Now this theory of sound ought to be tested. Because it is an empirical. Yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, well, I think it means that the case of the sound wave is the outer world. I mean, there is the. He said, let me give you an example in the outer world. He's hard to understand, so I'm going to put it at normal speed. Listening individual. Okay, and so he's saying there's a sound, there's a listening individual. Come the sound waves. And what the first impression is... And here comes the sound waves, their first impression. The individual listens, they seem to be acoustic impression, a note. Yes? Now he develops a theory of sound. And the theory of sound is that the note is caused by vibrations in the air which move in this direction. Now this theory of sound ought to be tested because it is an empirical theory. How can we test it? <coughs> well, we, test it. we can test it in very many ways. We can test it, for example, letting sounds go into closed tubes and giving them dust particles in which we see the dust particles are arranged in a harmonious pattern. Mm-hmm. Or that we shape. Yeah, so here he's talking about the external thing, sound, what the sound is, the sound wave that he's saying we can, we, we, we discovered it or whatever it is, but that's not what we think of as the sound in the sense of the quality. I do know that in the old days they, they talked about the qualities as being out there, but nowadays we're much more likely to say they're in here and we just represent them as being out there. So maybe that's uh, where we're getting hung up on this from. So that's what he's saying. You could put sound, you could play some music or something, put it through a tube, you can see the dust particles moving. So hence evidence that it's a sound wave moving through there. But that doesn't mean that the sound is moving through there the way we experience it. Um, that may nonetheless only arise in the mind. Even uh, or in different factors depending on the way in which the sperm is strict. This means the theory can be tested despite the fact that perhaps we do not at all think anymore about the quality of impressions we have when we listen to the, t- to the notes. Because introducing the theory means establishing, making many more predictions than we have made before. Before we made only predictions from sound to what? I mean, two impressions of term. Now we can make predictions from sound to things which can be tested much more carefully. Because the impression of tone, the ear, is not a very good instrument in some respects. So the ear has to be represented first when there's a tuning fork that one sees. And finally, I mean, by theory analyzer, analyzer which sees what kind of, what kind of vibration arises here. So on the basis of the theory itself, we shall realize that the way in which we discovered it is not the best way to test it. This means we shall give up our quality of knowledge of sound. I see, so... He's saying the way we discovered what it was by hearing it, by the experience that we have of it, isn't the best way to find out what its true nature is, because to know what the nature of sound is in the external environment, you need to have all sorts of devices like tuning forks and weird things and blah, blah, blah. And so the way we discovered it isn't the way we study it. Is the idea the same about the mind? The way we discovered the mind from the first person is in the way we should study it. It's not the best way to test it. This means we shall give up our quality of knowledge of sounds and we shall test the field completely independently. Now, exactly the same thing, I say, should happen in the case of human beings. Now, the have you. In, in a theory of human beings, never mind how you call it. So, now here... They all look like robots. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so he's mocking his drawing. He said they look like robots. Um, so he said the same thing should happen in the case of pain. So I think I was misunderstanding him a little bit last time. If I'm understanding him right this time, one of the two times I'm misunderstanding. <laughs> so he's saying in the case of sound, we, we discovered the phenomenon by experiencing it. Then we found out what it was. We test this theory that there are sound waves. So now we discover this phenomenon of pain from experiencing it. We have a theory, it's a brain state, so then we figure out a way to test it, what the nature of it is. But then you're not in a limit of it, you're testing the nature of it. So let's, so we didn't eliminate the quality. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay, let's hold on. Let's see how he's going to flesh the analogy out. Uh, here, they all look like robots. <laughs> <laughs> here, we, here we stand also with various things which we experience phenomenologically. Like we experience from the outside the sound, so we experience from the inside, I mean the pain comes somewhere from here, sometimes from here, then also sensations, or the sensations when I have my eyes closed, after dark adaptation, very curious sensations, and so on. And then we develop other theories in order to account for the occurrence of these sensations. Now assume that one of the theories is a completely materialistic theory. Then again it will develop various processes going on inside here, not necessarily wave like very complicated processes, and will be capable of making many predictions which can be tested maybe with much greater security and precision, as one can test anything by simply feeling what is going on. For example, if you have a pain, I mean, something is probably going on in, in the central nervous system, but you can find this out in much greater precision by simply looking at the central nervous system, or also by looking at your brain vibration, or all sorts of things. Again, in this case, the pains and the sensations and the thoughts are all the first step in the subjection of a theory, which then itself will suggest much better and much more precise tests for what is going on inside the human being in terms of this theory than the original starting point was, which was very good. Yeah, so that's like the kind of eliminativism that I'm familiar with from the Rorty and the Churchlands type stuff the language of the neural sciences or whatever science you're interested in may better capture the thing that you originally were in, thought you were interested in, which you were picked out imperfectly in this way as being like something mental, non-physical, something like that. So I think that's what he's saying is that these, these theories may better describe it. Um, and so then we would get rid of the terms, not talk about them because we have a better understanding of it at the physical level. And then we would see the thing we went to look for wasn't really there, sort of like the caloric thing. Once we understood the physical level better, we would see the thing wasn't there. Whereas Feigl saying, once we understood the physical level better, we would understand the nature of the thing. Very similar to what's happening currently. Yeah, such an interesting discussion. Um, okay, so as I was editing this, uh, I came to realize, I think I misunderstood the point that I was making right here. So it's early and everyone's sleeping. I'm trying to be a little bit quiet, but I think that what he's actually saying right here, what he's actually saying right in this little spot right here is that uh, we start off with knowing about like our experience from the first person point of view. We say, I know when there's a pain around, you don't. I have a special access to it, acquaintance, whatever you want to call it. Then we uh, postulate that uh, we do some science. We say, okay, so we want to know about the central nervous system. Whenever you're in pain, there's this brain state going on. So now if we think the pain is this physical brain state, then <clears throat> if we want to know when you're in a pain, we don't ask you, although we could, but you know that you're not the most, you're not the best way to find out about it. Um, we, we go to the, the nervous system and we start looking, well, is this activity there or not? That's the way you know if there's a pain. That's the way you test what pains are and how you find out about their natures, according to Feyerabend. <laughs> I don't know how to say his name. Is it Feyerabend? Um, so that's that's the point that he's making right here. It's, it's the, that we start off with the thing in question, but then once we have a theory about it, we're able to test it, to know about it, to find out about the thing um, in ways that go beyond the way where we started from the experience. And so that the experience is kind of, um, we cast it aside uh, as an interesting tool for understanding the thing that we are investigating. And we appeal to more precise tools. I, th that's the point that he's making. I don't even know if that's an eliminativism point. I mean, I think it is. It's like a heterophenomenological point, right? That, um, I think that this, I was sort of assimilating it in this part right here to uh, the church lens or something, but really I think it's closer to Dennett that the way you do science is to, you, you have to do it from the outside. You're, there's no, you know, you can't really postulate these, the, the subject as a source of, um, 
data that's distinct from the kind of data we get from the outside. Yeah, I think that's what's going on here. Okay, <laughs> back to the original. Inside the human being in terms of this theory, then the original starting point was it was very deep and, and then you're the your reductive fallacy, you're reducing psychophysiology to physiology. Yeah, see, so there's Feigl's, that's the reductive fallacy. I'm going to bring that back, reductive fallacy. <laughs> that's the nothing buts and the something mores. We want the philosophy of the what's what. I'm with the what's what. <laughs> reductive fallacy, let's go. Team Feigl. The psyche is over. Nothing quite anything like the psyche. You see, um... Wait, hold on, what did he... The reductive fallacy, you're reducing psychophysiology to physiology. Psych you're reducing psychophysiology to physiology, but remember by reduction here, they mean elimination, basically. Um, you know, yeah, you're eliminating the psycho, the, the mental, in, in, you're eliminating it and saying instead all there is is the physical, as opposed to saying what well, you should be saying which is that we're studying the nature of it and we find out that it's physical. That's what I want to say. I think that's the way I'm interpreting Feigl here. No. But they can't say anything like this, You see, um, I mean... Yeah, so he's, his response was, the question is, is there anything like a psyche? Which is, that's how, that's how I would just sit, ah, that's how I was just putting it, I think. Right, so we have this notion of what the mental is, we go and look for it. We don't find anything like that, so we say no mental. Or as the other side says, we have this notion of what the mental is. We go and look for it. We find, oh, it's correlated with his brain state. So then what? Ah, it is the brain state. Um, so the key question is, as always, wh whether some of these properties, which some people have said go with the mental, are essential to it and whether you can have something mental without it. Uh, but even there, I'm not sure why we, I mean, if you set things up in the way, that's what we're saying last time. If you set things up in the way where you say, look, by definition, the mental is something that um, I have direct acquaintance with and no physical things are things that I have direct acquaintance with. Then, of course, I agree with the point. That's illegitimate. You're defining the thing as non-physical. You shouldn't do that. But, of course, um, that's very different than saying, look, there is this thing. It appears to have these properties. What physical thing in the brain is it correlated with? That's what it is then. I mean, what the... So why think that you're not going to find that thing in the brain? I guess I could, I could see if you really didn't find anything like that. But how would you know if you found it or not? If you don't think it's there? <laughs> yeah, limitivism. Still frustrating. My psyche, my psyche, I mean, merely really the data of the immediate experience, to which you have to return anyway. Take your example of the sound. Uh, yeah, so by psyche, he just means the experience, so the example of sounds, right? I, I once had a discussion with Gilbert Ryan, outstanding linguistic behaviorist from Oxford. He is an as uh, our friend here is, of the theory of sense data. Now, I'm not a particular friend of the theory of sense data because I consider it rather unfruitful in, in epistemology to, tr to attempt uh, a reconstruction of the world on the basis of, of sense data only and then by purely logical means. For reasons of my own, I reject this. But Right, so that's the the thing I was saying. I thought Firebrand was doing that the uh, the sense data bit about the world really is a construction out of these these sensory qualities. So there's no really table. There's just sense data arranged table wise or something. So yeah, he rejects that. Good, 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 good. Yes. Or sense data only, and then by purely logical means, for reasons of my own, I reject this. But that the idea of sense data, the idea of items or elements of immediate experience, is mistaken. I cannot be convinced of. So I gave him the following example. This is an act, something that actually happened. So he said the idea, so he disagrees with sense data and that you could build the word out, but the idea that there's an immediate quality to, of experience that we apprehend, which he's saying the idea of a sense data, that he doesn't reject. Okay, good. I mean, I, I, I 
think what he's saying is because of the time that he's in, but basically he's saying he doesn't reject conscious experience. That it's real, he's not going to give it up. Um, right. I cannot be convinced of. So I gave him the following example. This is an act, something that actually happened to me. Speaking of sounds reminded me of it. Once in the evening I lay in bed, I had already turned out the light and was fairly tired. And um, I had an experience that I can only describe as having heard a sound. I was hearing a sound. I asked myself on that occasion, is this a distant police car siren? Is perhaps the telephone ringing downstairs, we haven't got any upstairs, it, um, uh, it, it could have been either, or is it the so-called ringing in my ears, you know, you have that experience once in a while, which is a purely internal affair. Now the experience I had was... So I think I see where he's going with this, right? So he's laying in bed, he's having an experience, he hears a sound, and then he's saying, is this a siren? Is this just ringing in my ears? Is this the telephone ringing downstairs? And the this there picks out the experience, which could be indicating either of these things. He's not sure if it's internally generated, is it something in the world, but he knows he's having an experience. And when he says, when he thinks, is this the ringing of the phone? What he means is this sound that I'm experiencing right now. So that, I think this is his response the why he's not going to give up the idea of experience. And these are sorts of things I totally agree with. We have that kind of first person access to our experience. It's almost comical to deny it. And we don't merely think that we do. We really, we really do. Of course, they say that's what someone who thinks that they do, what that doesn't, let's say. In my ears, you know, we have that experience once in a while, which is a purely internal affair. Now the experience I had was so indefinite that it could have been due to any one of these three causes. Now what was it that I'm asking about as far as its causal ancestry is concerned? That is, I was asking, where did it come from? Police car siren, telephone bell, ringing in the ears, presumably some physiological process uh, in, in my ear. I couldn't tell at the moment, but I did have that experience. So I'm talking about something to which we always have to return, no matter what you test. If you make your test in physical acoustics, you have to see your tube with the dust in it, you have to perceive something. You cannot extirpate the mental out of this universe uh, without depriving yourself of the very foundation of knowledge to which we always must return. I had the pleasure of discussing one aspect of this problem with Albert Einstein one year before his death, and then his uh, strong language that he often used, and he laughed about his own jokes very heartily, and uh, he said, uh, I, I tried to explain to him, now isn't this your view, uh, Professor Einstein asked him, the world in its four dimensional uh, structure is so to speak illuminated in spots, namely in those spots where we have living central nervous systems, they have so to speak the inner light, the inner light, so he said to me in German, when that's not so there, the world is not from a mist, if that were not so, the whole world would be a pile of manure. <laughs> yeah. so, that's so. What? Is that, did he say that was Einstein who said that? He said, could you describe the four-dimensional structure? So you have this space-time structure, causal history of the world laid out, so to speak, in temporal order. That can be sliced up in various ways because of relativity, blah, blah, blah. But he was asking, could you describe the experiencers and those things as little lights, like the sources of lights? And Einstein saying something like, if that weren't so, the world would be a pile of shit or a pile of manure. Um, yeah, so you don't have to. So I agree with all that stuff, of course, but I, I don't think that gets you to sense data. Sense data, the, the problem with sense data is that they're out there. They're supposed to be somehow objective, but mental, but some things that we're aware of when we have conscious experience. So they're like, I don't know, strange things. Um, but uh, as far as just experience goes, consciousness, I agree with everything he's saying. Um, when I say, what is this? I wouldn't say what's, you know, um, what's the cause of it uh, is, of course, the right question. But they're saying, you know, what's this? Ex what are you experiencing? So is it the, something internal, external? Uh, who knows? But there's an experience there, you're picking it out when you say, what is this an experience of? 
so that this has got to pick something out that's experiential. I don't think it's got to be an object. I don't think that I fall for that argument. If there's a red experience, then there's something red around. I may be representing something that's being red around. Anyway, obviously when you write the word red, R-E-D, on a piece of paper, there's nothing red around unless you use red ink, but you need not. So if you write in black ink, R-E-D isn't really red, but it represents red. So there are cases of representing where the thing represented is different than the representing thing. And so maybe mental stuff is like that. Not exactly like words, obviously, but it's not in some sense similar. Okay, so yeah, uh, but I agree with this point. We're not going to give up experience. Okay, so let's get back to it. Uh, so the world would not be what it is if it were not for this inner life. We wouldn't be talking, we wouldn't be... Uh, you see, what I mean by the mental is not any substantial soul, it's not anything spiritualistic. I mean something that, in one sense, carefully to be defined, is subjective, is private in that sense, and is intentional. Roughly speaking, yeah. if I were to define mine... Right, so he says, I don't mean anything spiritual. I mean something subjective, private, and intentional. That's a real traditional <laughs> kind of definition. Yeah, well, that's what we mean. It's got intentionality. It's representational. It's subjective. It exists from your point of view. It's private. You know about it in a privileged way. Um, and it's that could also be physical. Yeah, it could. Probably is, man. We had a question, what is your definition of positive animism? We are not talking about that tonight. So if somebody asks me, what do you mean by mind or the mental or the psychic, the psychical? All I mean is the, com the peculiar combination that we know from human experience and immediate experience on the one hand and intelligence, purpose, intentionality on the other. That's all I mean. I have no axe to grind in terms of a theological soul. Let me give you an example. Yeah, and I agree with that as well. So the whole idea that you need to define the mental in as some way non-physical from the beginning, I think is wrong. You just can mean subjective, private. He didn't say ineffable, but you know, you could, I think all those things could still be physical. Uh, I don't think there's anything there about them. That means they're not physical, maybe unusual. All right, let's do it. About, about shooting stars. I think we discussed this example before. I'm not an observer of shooting yeah. stars in my team. So, shooting stars a long time ago, I mean, today... Shooting stars, that's the example. Okay, so we know they're comets, not stars. The, the light comes from their entering the atmosphere, something like that. So, this, this is going to be the idea. We know they are due to the fact that little pieces of matter come into the atmosphere at higher speed and burn up. And so, this is the phenomenon of the shooting star. Now, at the time of Aristotle, it was assumed that shooting stars were similar due to uh, illnesses of the eye, not illness, more disturbances, like sometimes when you see things. In the of body, there are some, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you see sw things swimming around, especially people with bad eyes. And so on. I didn't know that. Something swimming? In the well, I guess, yeah, the ether. The ether. Okay, so, right. So they had a different theory about what shooting stars were, right? I mean, on the wall, one sees all sorts of things dancing around, and one says, of course, it's due to... Oh, yeah, moon sky yeah. volley tantrums, they call it, on the middle. Moon sky volley tantrums, yeah. big in the middle. Yeah. Now, this was the Aristotelian idea, so according to this, this was uh, an object in the eye, through which one looked and so projected on the, uh, projected, uh, on the sky, so therefore nothing objective at all. Now, today... Oh, wait, really? It was something on the eye? projected onto the sky. Is that what he just said the Aristotelian view of these things was, shooting stars? So they weren't even something in the world. They Is that really, he really was thinking of shooting stars as something mental, something in the eye? Like a like a moat, a particle, like those little thingamabobs you get in the eye, a floaty? <laughs> Which you could tell are not out there. Um, Well, they do it seem like they're out there, like they're not part of just purely met. Wait, what? Okay, I did not know that. That's that's bizarre. All right, I'll have to look. This at was uh, an object in the eye, so which one looked and so projected on the uh, projected uh, on the sky. So therefore, not an objective at all. Now today we can give an objective account of these things here by assuming that it is simply. So the idea was that he thought they were mental, subjective. Now we have an objective account of them. Okay. 
particles going down here. Now, somebody observes this falling down. What happens? Two things happen. First of all, I mean, he has the impression that the thing is falling down. This impression must be given, and, and, uh, otherwise it could not be able by observation to say what has happened. Then secondly, he describes it. Say, this is a shooting star. But this, this description has a particular character in a twofold respect. First of all, it is a description which is causally connected with my having seen the shooting star. And this is why we call it an observational description. Uh, then when I turn around and say, there is a shooting star and I have guessed it. It is not an observational description. But in this case, when I see it and immediately say, oh, there is a shooting star, it's causally connected with the occurrence uh, that I utter it, and therefore it is an observational description. And this is one side. The other side asks out about the content. What does the description say? The description says that there goes an objective process on in the atmosphere, that the thing is falling down. It is a very rich description into which we have packed all our knowledge about astronomical phenomena. So, oh, or some of our knowledge about astronomical phenomena. And this is quite difficult. Also at times, the stars, with many people, I mean, uh, presumably don't know what the stars are, they just uh, are final appearances. Now, the stars simply are material things very far away of a very high temperature. Now apply the very same also to what we say about our pains and about our sensations. Of course, even if we are materialists, we shall continue to say on certain occasions that we have pain. And these will be the occasions when we indeed do have pain, and the, sen the, the sentence which we utter will be an observational sentence, because it has been caused by what is going on inside ourselves, namely by the pain. But what will the content of the sentence be? Okay, so he's making a distinction between what the what causally produces the thing and the way it describes the thing that produced it. Okay, so we have some state in us. It produces the utterance, I'm in pain. But how does it describe it? It's going to sound as non-physical, right? That's the idea. Now, if I go in perfect parallel to what goes on in the sky, I would say the content of our sentence should concern what we know about pains, everything. And now talking in a utopian fashion and assuming that a very good analysis in materialistic terms is the given of human beings, then this content will simply be, when I say on the occasion that I'm having pain, I shall be asserting the occurrence of the material process inside myself. And therefore, I shall also make a very rich statement, which could be tested and refuted, namely by somebody when the uh, occurrence is, for example, asserted to go on somewhere here. And if it is asserted to be of a specific kind, so that it can be discovered in a certain fashion, and somebody bores a hole here and doesn't find anything, my statement that I have a pain will be refuted. Now, our <coughs> argument, the argument between people... Okay, so wait a minute. So he's saying, okay, so you say... <coughs> I have a pain, we look for it, we can find the state that caused it or not. I mean, the, the, the material state, because you're asserting the existence of the material state when you say I have a pain. I mean, the dualists could agree with that insofar as they think that, I mean, that, that the mind is somehow got to interact with the body. Yeah, so I'm not sure I understand. Let me, okay. Certain fashion, and somebody bores a hole here and doesn't find anything, my statement that I have a pain will be refuted. Now, our argument, the argument between Professor Feige and myself is now the following. Professor... Oh, I see. Okay, I think I see where he's going with this. So, if we look inside and don't find the thing that you say you have, then you are wrong. So if the thing you say you have is this weird non-physical thing, that, that's not what you have because you're saying something about brain saying. So now he's going to use this as a way to diagnose the debate with him and Feigl, right? Is that what's going on here? The argument, the argument between Professor Feigl and myself is now the following. Okay. Professor Feigl says that they are in addition to the statements about the physical objects and to the rich and rich materialistic statements about inner statements of a third kind. 
namely statements which are not so rich, although they are not completely empty, but are also observational. So we have now three different kinds of statements. The best okay, so we have this third kind of statement is the acquaintance kind. Uh, I have what this, I'm having this kind of experience, pure phenomenal, blah, 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 kind of statement, but it's still an observational statement, which means that it can be, we can check for what the cause of it is, right? But are also observational. So we have now three different kinds of statements. The best thing, as a matter of fact, would be if we have the sensation of a star, yeah? Somebody looks at a star, and if somebody utters a statement, there is a star, on the occasion of seeing a star, yes? Then there can have three different kinds of statements on this very same occasion can be caused in this. The one, there is a star, which is an observational statement, because it has been uttered in the presence of a, and which says something about the physical process. The other thing, there is a star perception, or there is a star sensation. There's a bright spot on the dark background of my visual field. Well, yes, I mean, how we pronounce it doesn't matter. I mean, it can be... <laughs> <laughs> what? These guys are funny. Um, a white spot on my visual field is supposed to a star perception. Whatever, so, okay. Um, how do you pronounce it? Yeah, so it doesn't matter. The point is, you say that. Words we, but words we use does not matter. I mean, what we mean by it is of essence. We could even still say there is a star, meaning now is a objective star. I mean, it could be the same words, but a different interpretation. And mean by this, simply that inside ourselves there is going on a certain material physiological process of a very complicated kind, of which perhaps we can someday give a very detailed account. This statement is also observational. It is not a statement which is about completely nothingness, it is an observational statement because it is uttered in connection with the process going on inside myself. So both these statements are observational. This second statement, as it is observational, can be used for testing any theory about what is going on inside human beings. And therefore can be used for testing materialism. Now Professor Fein wants to introduce a third kind of statement. So the second kind, of, so the second kind of statement, these rich material connections. There's a physical process in me, you know. Um, these are, I think, what something like Keith Brinkley would call proto phenomenal properties or something like that. There's this rich physical thing. So when I say I'm in pain, I'm asserting the existence of that kind of state, um, and that can be tested and do we can do science on. So you can kind of see where he's going. Is it but the Feigl kind of state? You can't, right, because it's private and subjective. Was that the idea? Materialism. Now Professor Fein wants to introduce a third kind of statement. The third kind of statement is also observation, and namely it will be uttered simply in connection with this phenomenon. It will be different from both statements. How will it be different? It will not have a third kind of knowledge contained in it. I mean, if, for example, suddenly we discover that there is also something like a theological domain so that, I mean, the spirits, I mean, enter us. I and never, I never discovered that such thing. No, 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 I don't say you do. I mean, this is a possibility. I mean, if then one could have such a... No, this third kind of statement is not of that kind, I want you to say. But it is either this kind of statement or this kind of statement minus quite a lot of consequences. Namely, in the case of the inner kind, minus the assertions about the occurrence of a material process. In the case of the outer, minus the things uh, about what goes on out there, I mean, uh, uh, so many life years avoid. Right, so the idea is it's so impoverished that you can't do anything with it because you know, the, it, it, you've isolated it. It has nothing to do with the behavior. It has nothing to do with what you say. It has nothing to do with how you act. Oh, I see. Oops. Um, it's just the way it feels. You just picked out this 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 kind of thing that has a you know this acquaintance with a, a, a property that a quality, redness. Um, but uh, you, you can't you can't do anything with it because it's isolated. Yeah, I mean, I really see that this is like. A, a, a very, very, very similar to the contemporary critiques of like the Chalmers type style properties, dualism arguments. Uh, I could even see elements of this like Dennett. Dennett, you're thinking of uh, consciousness like health, something you can just remove 
uh, something isolated from behavior, like you just imagine a zombie, something functional and duplicate of you with no consciousness. Um, I think he's saying, yeah, well, because you've limited this thing so much, you can do that. But then, like, you also say it's an observation statement, which in their context, I think, means it's ma it's like made in the presence of something. <laughs> or, like, you can talk about what causes it or a way to test it or how to, what what you would observe if uh, were there or not there, et cetera. But how, but if it's really disconnected from all those other things, then what's left, what's left? That's the sense I'm getting from this. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so as many life years, avoid Now I say, all that he wants to assert is contained in this statement too. Of course, this is part of its content, but there is also something else. This statement which he wants to introduce is not some kind of new knowledge, but this statement in public, this is crossed out. But why we can't do such a thing? Why can't some frantic tapping on a chalkboard going on right now. So this statement doesn't contain any new knowledge. The type three, well, the knowledge of what the of the experience, but but it's not like because it's just a physical thing. So all the stuff you knew physically is already basically the same, right? It's basically a knowledge argument style consideration, it seems to me. I mean, on the occasion of uh, of an, uh, when one has when one knows so much, in power it one statement only work with the tenth of what one knows. For so this, I want to an answer first. So I can represent you. Be it I do, why do you do such a thing? <laughs> He said, well, privately, I think it's all horseshit, but uh, publicly, I have to say, yeah, maybe. <laughs> he has pee in some You would say it So. And you said it publicly now. I know. Why? Why? So. If it is the aim of science that we pursue certainly, but you have not answered my uh, most poignant question at this point. If, for instance, in a future psychophysiology we want to find out what, for instance, a state of elation or depression in a manic depressive uh, psychosis, what this, what this amounts to neurophysiologically, then we can, of course, be behavioristic and say, oh, we know what people are like and how they behave in the manic phase. We know what they are like uh, and how they behave in the depressed uh, phase. And that's all that they're correlating. But anyone who's had the experiences of elation and depression also knows what is talked about when we mention these moods. And I insist that these mood words do designate qualities of immediate experience. That in this one sense, we do not behaviorize in this reduction in sense that it, it is a question of an empirical science what is correlated on the neurophysiological side with these moods that we can recognize. Right, so he's saying, you haven't answered my most pointed question, which is, this doesn't really seem like a question, but he's saying, look, we have these things like elation and joy. You can't just be a behaviorist. There's something internal going on. The subject so, uh, has an experience of it. Um, so in order to do any science, you have to sort of ask them about it. They'll tell you whether which one that it is. Then it's an empirical question. What physical states correlate with that thing that they're picking out? So you can do science on the thing that he's interested in. Um, yeah, right. I agree. What is correlated on the neurophysiological side with these moods that we can recognize when they come again? Yeah. There I go again, I'm blue. 
You think you can do that once in a while, I'm sure. I recognize this when I feel blue, all right? Uh, this is something I know by acquaintance. Right, so you recognize that feeling again. Like when you're depressed, you can tell. It's the same. Oh, there's that. I'm depressed. I can tell I recognize that feeling. When I see red, we recognize these things when they occur in us. Uh, uh, we, uh, there's that feeling again. And, you know, we type experiences like this all the time. We can tell the difference between a sound and a, and a, and a color it, it, by experiencing them. We recognize there it is again. The experience. There's the experience again. There's that mood again, not the thing out there, the depression, the feeling, right? That's the point here. Physiology uh, is, uh, part of its task is to correlate what is designated by the introspective term with what is designated by the corresponding neurophysiological term. Right, so he's assuming there's something designated by those introspective terms. And I think that's exactly what Firebrand's questioning. Is there anything that's designated by those introspective terms? Especially given that you've stripped them of all their connections and content and just limited them to this very thin notion of a feeling, a phenomenal character, as we would say nowadays, or something like that. I go beyond this, and really in your direction, and you should appreciate this, <laughs> when I say scientific explanation will come from the physical uh, system of concept formation and uh, the formulation of physical laws because this is more comprehensive. As we said two weeks ago, for those of you who were here, we have tried to indicate that the march of science is along these levels where we have some minor disagreements. He said, as we said two weeks ago, I wonder if there's recordings of other ones of these sessions. These sessions are cool. Right along these levels of scientific explanation. By the way, I have some copies here in case somebody wants to know my views, not his, about, uh, about the levels of scientific inquiry, even with medical exam uh, examples. I suppressed handing them out last time. I must have been intimidated. So, um, I return to the question as to whether there isn't something to knowledge by acquaintance when we talk about the recognition of moods, for instance as we do it introspectively and as we do it uh, in the, uh, let's say, psychotherapeutic situation and the like. Moreover, and this is deeper epistemology, I would maintain that any kind of confirmation of a physical theory, such as we both will champion, uh, any kind of confirmation must ultimately go down to the data of direct experience. But they are always interpreted in the light of some theory, I will be the first to insist, not only to admit. But without these data, the astronomer seeing a bright spot going through across, meaning the crosshairs in his telescope, this is the final step of verification of something or other, of a prediction or of a theory or an hypothesis. To be sure, it wouldn't mean anything unless we could interpret it in terms of theory. But without this ground floor of direct experience, there is no science. Without that, you'd have only mathematics, pure mathematics, a purely conceptual system. Empirical science must somewhere come to rest, must somewhere be based on the data of direct experience. Yeah, I, I like that point. Science must be based on the direct experience. Otherwise, you just have math. Conceptual systems... That's like the what breathes fire into the equations comments from uh, Hawking's or whoever. Um, there's got to be something there. Now, of course, I don't know. The, the, the limited basic can say, yeah, of course, there's something there. The material states of the system. We're zombies. There's nothing mental. We can still do what we do. And we'll just learn more about it by abandoning those terms and studying the brain and using those that language. So I don't really, I mean, I agree with Feigl, but I don't really see that that you can't do science without experience point. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think that uh, the limitivists of the world could respond, yeah, we can. Oh, okay. okay. David? No. <laughs> Dr. Hastings, would you uh, care to join the parade? No, I don't know. Who's Dr. Hastings? I don't know who that is. I don't know the leave expert questions to experts. <laughs> Dr. Hathaway? I think there's a gentleman back there. Yes, sir. 
I agreed entirely with what uh, Dr. Fungo has just been saying, but I wish he would clear up an apparent inconsistency in his statement. At near the beginning of his address... So he said there's an apparent inconsistency in Feigl's position he wants him to clear up. ...describing his uh, discussion with his son, he said that we must be very careful to keep these two things, <coughs> the experience on the one hand, the experience of pain, and the cortical correlate on the other, keep them entirely distinct. They must not be reduced to one to the other. At the end of his speech, he said that his solution of the problem consisted in recognizing that these two languages named the same thing, just as uh, Tully and Cicero did. Now what puzzles me is... Yeah, see, so this guy's asking a question like what uh, that I think I was addressing when I was making those comments about his use of the word reduction there. Because this guy is saying, yeah, you said you, you want to avoid reducing the, the mind to the physical. You want to avoid the reductive fallacy or the eliminative fallacy, as I would call them. Um, but you also want to say that there's nothing but the physical there. So it sounds like you're saying they're nothing buts and not the what's what's. But of course, the difference is eliminativism versus identifying the nature of the thing. So that should be the answer, right? That I'm predicting. If these two things are the same, what becomes of the argument offered in the earlier part of the address? If these two things are different, how could Professor Pardo have ended the address by saying that they're the same? <laughs> this is Did you hear that crowd? Wow, this is a, this is a, <laughs> the crowd's like, ooh, ah, gotcha. <laughs> Oh, what you got to say to that, Professor Feigl? <laughs> uh, I think he's going to say something, hopefully, along the lines I just said. Let's, uh, it'll be interesting to hear. I'm glad that this guy asked. I wonder who that is um, that asked that question. Uh, interesting to hear the answer. Question asked by one philosopher of the world. This is an excellent question asked by one philosopher of another. And I should love to discuss it at greater length. Let me at first uh, reply by way of an, uh, an example, which does not quite fit the case, but take, let, take the example about the identity of the author of King Lear with the author of Hamlet. Now, these two descriptions are not identical, because uh, after all it was logically conceivable that the person who wrote King Lear need not have written uh, Hamlet and, or vice versa. Right, so that's a familiar point. The two descriptions don't have the same meaning. I think that's what he means by identical. Um, and that they, they might pick out the same person in real life, but of course we can imagine cases where they might not have picked out the same person. Maybe, you know, some people speculate maybe Shakespeare didn't even write all those. Maybe there's no one person who is Shakespeare, so maybe different people wrote them. So you get the point there, right? Okay. So my view of the matter is to speak professionally, that we have a difference in intention, but identity in extension. Identity of reference. So intention there is with an S, an extension. So extension is what the thing picks out, and the intention is a uh, well. You, uh, the people will give different definitions of what it, but the intention is usually like something like the concept or mental. Some people might identify the sense or something. I don't know. It's like, but. Uh, um, the meaning is one another way of, of sometimes the, so the intention determines the reference in a sense um so okay they have the same extension so, My view. so the two descriptions have different intentions different meanings um but they pick out the same thing in the real life case matter is to speak professionally that we have a difference in intention but identity in extension, identity of reference, but non-identity in the uh, predicates that we use uh, for the characterization of the event uh, uh, characterized. Even this will not quite wash, but this is a, a rough first approximation of what I would answer and have answered in my long essay in the second volume of Minnesota Studies in the Philosophy of Science. The thing is still uh, uh, controversial. I get support from 
some philosophers and quite a few arguments, partly along your lines, from others. I hope the thing can be worked out. But as a first answer to your indeed very poignant and searching question, I would say that we can have differences in characterization. For instance, lab the label that we give on the basis of introspection to an experience, and I'm sure you understand that language, uh, since you are not a behaviorist, uh, Professor Blanchett, uh, the label that... Oh, Professor Blanchett? Blanchett? I don't know who that is, but okay, so that's a... So look up whoever that was. But so the idea here is, so you have these two different languages. They did two different descriptions. They, they're they not the same. So you got to keep them separate because they could have been different. And that's the contingent identity claim, which a lot of people think is get, you get you in trouble. Um, but so you have the description in the terms of the brain and then the thing describing the pain. They happen to pick out the same thing here, but he's uh, saying that they don't mean the same thing. they could have picked out different things but so you don't want to identify the reductive fallacy of saying they mean the same thing or that um there there is no such thing as the thing in question but you want to just say that these two descriptions happen to pick out the same thing so what happens when you get that when you change this update to the idea that the identities are necessary if they are that's an objection that was often made. I, I'll have to come back and talk about that later. It's already getting too long and I'm running out of time, but there's still two minutes left, so let's finish it up. I give to my experience as being elated or as being gay or serene or feeling uh, frolicsome or whatnot, or on the other hand, uh, despondent, <laughs> depressed or whatnot. If I describe my experiences in this way, I label them by labels that uh, conventionally are associated with the kind of experiences I have and which are evoked by the experiences when they come. I've learned that language. No matter now how I've learned it. Skinner will tell you on Thursday that I've learned it because my mother told me uh, when I was young, when she saw that I was sort of uh, slowed down, so now you're feeling pretty poor and blue again and so on, so I learned the, the meaning of blue, you see. This, this, this may be quite legitimate. Nevertheless, I know darn well what I'm talking about when I say I am depressed. That is, it is a certain mood or feeling uh, which I know by acquaintance and which has recurred in my life uh, once in a while. Now, this is one characterization that uh, amounts to not, not much more than mere labeling. Perhaps labeling within a set of mentalistic predicates, like in the case of the colors where we have a whole system of similarities and dissimilarities, with the emotions and moods it's not quite so simple, but even there we can order them to some extent. Now, the other characterization comes from the objective, public, physical characterization of the uh, nervous system. These characterizations are totally so different, but they may nevertheless refer to one and the same event, which you might say is known in these two ways. So by way of first rough approximation, I would say what I'm defending is a double knowledge approach to the mental and the physical. Two ways of knowing the same kind of event. Right, so two ways of knowing the same kind of event. But how does that answer the question about why isn't this a kind of reduction? Um, unless you mean by reduction, reduction by definitions, right? So it's not that. So, it, it, so, but it is a kind of reduction in a sense. Saying that thing really is nothing but that is often thought to be reductive in, in one sense of that word. So yeah, they may just be disagreeing on what the word reduction means. That's what my take on it is. Okay, so. Mm. That was a philosopher's answer to a philosopher's answer by June, I think. <laughs> But, you know, the doctor's question is, uh, not whether you're depressed or not, Dr. Parker, but how depressed are you? <laughs> <laughs> Tonight is the story. Tonight is the story. Tonight is the story. What's the story about the behavior? Meets the other on the street. He asked, he asked, he asked. What's his question? question? It's, uh, not whether you're depressed or not, Dr. Parker, but how depressed are you? <laughs> <laughs> Tonight is the story about the behaviorist. One meets the other on the, on the street. Uh, he asks the other one. Uh, he tells the other one, you are fine. You are fine. fine. How am I? <laughs> <laughs> That was fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, 
<clears throat> wow, what a timely and relevant discussion. What the fuck is that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. 